Thank you for tuning in to our virtual panel discussing the impact of COVID-19 on food, farming, and nutrition. My name is Rebecca Deeds, Director of Morvan Programs. This event is brought to you by UVA's Lifetime Learning, the Virginia Farm Bureau, and Morvan Programs. Our panelists for today's discussion include Kristen Suoka from the Local Food Hub, Kevin Ingalls from Ingalls Family Farm, Richard Morris from Cultivate Charlottesville, and Dr. Evelyn Scott from UVA Medical Associates. Our moderator for today's discussion is political science professor Paul Friedman. Thank you again for tuning in and we hope you enjoy the program. Well, thank you, Rebecca. And uh, I'd like to thank you and your staff at Morbin, along with Molly Harris uh, at the Virginia Farm Bureau and Althea Brooks and the staff at Lifetime Learning uh, for making this event possible. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists, but I also want to thank you, uh, the participants out there in the audience today for, uh, for joining us and for submitting uh, the great questions that many of you have already submitted. We're going to try to touch on as many of them as possible uh, today. This is a topic that I think is uh, obviously timely. Uh, the global pandemic has put pressure on our food system, both from the perspective of farmers and food producers, uh, but also from the perspective of eaters and consumers. In the area of, of food, as in so many other areas, the COVID crisis has exposed both the fragility uh, of our system, but also the resilience of our food system. Um, much of our food system has remained intact, uh, but there have been significant supply chain disruptions over the past six months. Uh, and of course, the restaurant industry has suffered staggering losses. Uh, for many of us, what and how we eat has changed during the course of the pandemic perhaps permanently, and that's one of the questions that we'll examine. Um, at the same time, the uh, COVID crisis has exposed longstanding pre-existing challenges, including structural inequities in our food system, uh, such as the glaring disparities in access to healthy and nutritious food in communities across the nation, including right here in Charlottesville. Um, we've also seen the pre-existing longstanding vulnerability of many food system workers, uh, including farmers and workers in the meat processing industry, again, both across the nation, but right here in Virginia. Uh, this crisis has turned so many of our food system workers into frontline workers. And I wanna hear today and talk today about what that has meant uh, in the face of COVID, uh, many of those who grow, prepare, distribute, and sell our food are often risking their health and their lives to keep us fed. So again, we'll hear about some of these frontline workers today. We'll learn about the efforts underway here in Virginia, right here in Charlottesville, uh, to address many of the challenges that have been caused and exposed by the COVID crisis. I want to begin uh, with our panelists today, and I want to begin by asking uh, them to uh, introduce their work, talk a little bit about um, uh, what, they, uh, what they do, uh, what their organizations, um, how their organizations have uh, had to respond to the pandemic, how it's affected their, their operations, how they've had to change, to pivot, to evolve uh, in the face of COVID. And we'll hear first from uh, Kristen Swacko from Local Food Hub, then from Kevin Engel, uh, third from Richard Morris, uh, and finally from uh, Evelyn Scott. Uh, and so to kick things off, Kristen. Great, hello everybody. Thank you for joining this discussion and thanks to the organizers for pulling it together. 
Local Food Hub is a nonprofit organization here, based here in Charlottesville, Virginia, in Central Virginia. We believe that a key element to surviving and thriving in a rapidly changing world is to have a strong local and regional food economy. Because the current food system, still dominated by large industrial, monolithic, uh, international players, uh, wasn't working fairly before the pandemic and certainly isn't working fairly now. Not doing any favors for our health or for the environment or for our, our communities. Local Food Hub was founded in 2009 to try and change some of these paradigms because we believe that access to good, affordable fair food and fair treatment of workers, the producers and care for the land are not mutually exclusive um, and they in fact should be non-negotiable. Um, so the first thing we did was to build a distribution business that helps small independent farmers and medium-sized farmers get their food to customers at a fair price for the farmer. Um, millions of dollars worth over the years. It was a marketplace, this wholesale marketplace was a hard one for smaller producers to crack um, and we helped do that. In 2018, we transferred that distribution operation to a mission aligned um, company that is now growing the business in ways that we as a nonprofit could not. At the same time, we built a, a whole bunch of scaffolding um, around the food system to help, uh, to help growers navigate these new marketplaces that they perhaps had not navigated before. Much of that is focused around the issues of food safety and new food safety regulation. We provide financial support for um, achieving certifications, um, which can often be complicated and expensive. Um, we help with production planning and we help with access to new markets. Um, and then finally, Local Food Hub has always believed that everyone, regardless of demographics um, or address, should be able to easily access fresh, healthy local food. Um, so five years ago, we launched the Fresh Pharmacy Fruit and Vegetable Prescription Program, um, serves people with low food access and who are at risk for diet-related diseases. Um, in five years, partnered with six different health clinics and served about um, 300 families a year. So earlier this year, we were on track to continue with all of that programming. Um, you know, thought we knew what, was, what we were up to, um, and then the pandemic started. So what happened then? Well, first of all, the usual markets for the farms that we work with evaporated. Um, restaurants, schools, farmers markets all shut down practically overnight. Supply chains faltered, um, especially as consumers um, scooped up food and, uh, and supply chains just could not keep up. Food insecurity quick, quickly became um, even more of an issue than it had been before. And racial inequities in farming and food access were exposed. But one of the attributes of diversified local systems is that they are nimble um, and they're able to pivot and be much more agile than large industrial monocrop systems. So with our farm partners, Local Food Hub was able to quickly develop a drive-through contactless farmer's market to continue making local food available to the community. Other farmer's markets in our area were able to follow on that model so that now we have a fairly robust system for, um, for folks to access food through, through that avenue. Uh, we were able to serve several dozen farms and we've in invested $500,000, over $500,000 in the local economy um, as, a, as a product of, of these markets. We also pivoted the Fresh Pharmacy Program. We started it much earlier. Um, we more than doubled the number of participants. We moved it to a weekly um, supply chain and we offered home delivery. So this allowed not only people to shelter in place in the healthiest way possible, but it also pr proved a lifeline for many of the smaller farms that we work with. Many of us believe that at this point, we would be moving past the pandemic crisis um, and thinking about recovery. That is not exactly the case, though the triage mode that we were in during the spring and summer has largely passed. Farmers are still facing continued uncertainty. Food insecurity continues to be a huge problem. Um, and of course, the racial equity issues in farming or in food access are more in the spotlight than ever. Um, so the good news is that organizations like ours and organizations throughout the community, we've got a tremendous, and we'll hear from some of them um, during this panel, we have a tremendous 
um, collaboration among community organizations that all pulled together to try and address a, a lot of these problems. And I think the key is going to be capturing the lessons that came out of the pandemic along with some of these new approaches um, to building a food system that's more equitable and health promoting than it was before. Terrific, Kristen, thank you. And, and I hope that we'll have a chance to follow up a little bit on uh, uh, some of those responses that you're describing. Um, Kevin, I'm hoping you can uh, tell us a little bit about the work that you do and how that has been affected by the pandemic. Well, thank you for having me today and thank you for everyone for their interest in food and nutrition. Uh, I think it's one of the most important things we can do for our long-term health. Uh, together with my family and a very committed staff, we farm a lot of grain crops in 19 counties in the state of Virginia, as well as a little bit in North Carolina. Um, we, we grow yellow corn, white corn, different varieties of soybeans, different varieties of wheat and barley and milo and rapeseed, and also some straw that's used for compost in the mushroom industries. Uh, it's about 23 and a half thousand acres of crops on an annual basis. Um, every year we keep, have been able to pick up a little more acreage and we keep growing. Um, a lot of our customers are Purdue with Purdue chicken, uh, Rockingham poultry with the turkey and chicken products up there, uh, Smithfield for hogs and, and uh, as well as several large dairies in the state for all of the milk production and everything that they do, um, as well as a lot of the, uh, our production, about 40 to 50% of our production is exported every year out of this country to other countries as well. So we monitor world markets as well as our U.S. markets when we're considering the sales of our crops. Um, together with our staff, we grow and we fertilize and we care for these crops and we also transport them to the end users at the time. So when the pandemic hit, um, we were considered a essential business, of course, and pretty much our business has ran seven days a week ever since then. Um, a lot of things have changed in the way that we distribute the grain. Uh, to the end users because a lot of the end users were going through a lot of pains adjusting to the rules and regs and the mixed messages that were coming out pertaining to the pandemic and how to keep things healthy. So I think a lot has been learned in that and I'm sure we have a whole lot more to learn as the future goes along. Um, you know, in, in 2019, 48% of the food consumed in the United States was consumed through restaurants. That had grown about 25 to 26% in two years from 2017. So we were quickly in this society transitioning to, from eating at home, preparing our foods at home to eating out. People in this country love to eat out. I'm one of them. Uh, I love to eat about anywhere, as a matter of fact. But uh, when the pandemic hit, and as Kristen had said earlier, you know, so many of the restaurants shut down and everything, that totally changed overnight the distribution of our uh, products to the, to the consumer. And that's hard for that large of a distribution system to pivot that quick. And uh, I think a lot has been accomplished. I think this country has one of the best and the safest and the most accountable food distribution industries in the world. But at the same time, to be prepared to pivot that quickly is almost an impossible challenge. Uh, there's no way that we can afford to have the capacity all the time to pivot if something like this pandemic comes along. So therefore, I think it's important for us as individuals to think quite a bit about uh, what do we want to eat if there's a, if there's a, if something could happen, and it doesn't have to be a pandemic, 
It can be major droughts. It can be um, um, uh, fires. I mean, good gosh, look what's happening in California. You know, these, there's, there's so many possibilities. What, what as individuals do we need to do to be better prepared to have the, a nutritional diet for ourselves at home for a longer length of time until such food industries can pivot to a change that may be necessary. Um, when I was growing up, my mother canned a lot of foods. Uh, she froze a lot of foods. We'd freeze uh, beef, we'd freeze pork, we'd freeze corn on the cob. We made applesauce, green beans, all kinds of things that we did. And we, we, we went to the store about once a month to get our groceries. These days, most people go to the store every couple of days. And uh, I think there's a lot that the consumer can do to, to be better prepared when something like this comes along. And um, that's just that's just making good sense to me, and I hope it would to uh, all of you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Hopefully, we'll have a chance to hear a little bit more about what some of those actions uh, might look like. Um, Richard, why don't you uh, tell us about the work of UAC and uh, cultivate? Thank you, Paul, uh, and thank you for the uh, opportunity to uh, participate in this uh, program. So my name is Richard Morris. I am with Cultivate Charlottesville. We are an equity-oriented, resident-focused nonprofit here. Uh, we have three primary programs that we operate through our City Schoolyard Garden Program. We have gardens in nine of Charlottesville's neighborhoods, with eight of those being located at public schools. These gardens provide hands-on experience, leadership and job skill development, and a broader perspective on what food equity, food justice, and racial equity looks like for youth. Uh, also, through our Food Justice Network Program, we do uh, food advocacy work where we work for public policy change around food equity issues. Uh, things like uh, working with the city of Charlottesville to ensure that uh, food equity language is inserted into the city's five-year plan. Uh, and as well as working with the city of Charlottesville on uh, making uh, broader, stronger commitments toward urban agriculture. Our third program is the Urban Agriculture Collective. Uh, through this program, we operate uh, urban gardens. We turn unused green spaces into places where we can grow greens and other fruits and vegetables. I am the uh, Farm and Food Roots Program Director for the uh, Urban Agriculture Collective. We believe working together to grow and share healthy food cultivates healthy communities. Our urban farm provides fresh produce at no cost to residents, people who might not otherwise have access to fresh produce. This amounts to tons of food uh, produced and shared, thousands of meals over the course of the season, feeding hundreds of local families. Now, as to change and COVID, uh, our situation was a little bit different. Uh, in 2020, we had to downsize uh, our gardens from uh, about an acre in total to about 4,400 square feet. We knew this was gonna happen. And so in 2019, we began forging partnerships with local farmers to help meet our anticipated shortfall in production. And then COVID came along. And so uh, COVID dovetailed with the work that we were already doing. So we reached out to farmers, we reached out to uh, food banks, we reached out to local uh, food hub. Uh, that you heard about a little bit earlier to help us meet our de the anticipated demand for food. One of the things we had to learn to do was to work without volunteers. We rely uh, heavily on volunteers to do the garden work. Uh, and then even once we started having volunteers back in the garden, which was a little bit later in the year, we had to figure out how to properly social distance with volunteers. Now, one of the things I discovered was I had no idea uh, how often you are in close proximity to the people working in the garden, even though it's a large space. Uh, so we had to figure out how to make that work. Our distribution model for the food that we produce looks a, a bit like a farmer's market. 
and ideally uh, residents would come up and they could choose the items that they want. We had to change that to comply with uh, COVID safety protocols. And so instead of allowing people to choose food, we had to pre-bag everything and make the operation as no touch as possible. Uh, normally our market days are social events. Neighbors get to get uh, caught up every Friday. They get to sit and talk and hang out. We get to talk to the local children and they get to sample certain foods, uh, different uh, foods that we produce. All of that we have to put on the back burner and essentially get people in and out as quickly as possible. Gardening and food is a social glue. And so uh, one of the big changes was uh, not being able to engage in the kind of natural social uh, interactions that happen in gardens and also around food. Uh, I would say as far as where we have evolved, um, we have always been strong supporters and believers in urban agriculture, but COVID has really helped us see um, urban agriculture not just as a an amenity, a, a benefit, a value add to uh, local neighborhoods and to communities, but also as an emergency uh, component. Uh, urban ag, local gardens help flatten the emergency food curve. If, you, if you're already producing food on site when an emergency happens, you shorten the delivery chain. The last mile uh, delivery issue doesn't exist because neighbors can walk to the garden and pick up food. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, Dr. Scott. I want to say thank you too for the, to the organizers for this opportunity. It's, it's just always so exciting for me to come and hear what's going on in the community and with regard to gardening and, 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 and the, the richness that we have in the Charlottesville area. Uh, so I am a clinician educator and I work at University Medical Associates, which is um, one of the, or the largest adult medicine clinics that we have at, at University of Virginia. Um, and we have a pretty significant um, panel of patients who are underinsured or uninsured. Um, and so when you think about how my job has changed since COVID, it used to be I would come to work, I would see patients, I would do some teaching with the residents, and I would go home. And, and so of course we had to do a, uh, a sea change of things to make sure people are safe in their interactions when they're coming to see their doctor and that they're able to access the care. So um, my day now starts with an, an app that I have to check in and assure uh, everybody that I don't have any COVID symptoms before I, I get to work. Um, I come to work and I, uh, meet up with my patients who have also gone through a similar type of screening and have been asked um, those questions probably two or three times by the time they end up in our office. They're wearing a mask. I'm wearing a mask and goggles and kind of look like a big bug when I come into the, to the clinic room. So I, I, that's all kind of changed. The waiting area almost looks like a game board because we have big dots on the floor where you're supposed to stand so that you're not too close to anybody and the, the chairs in the waiting room are kind of um, positioned almost like chess pieces so that they are six feet apart and everybody's safe. Um, but then when we get into, the, into that patient room and we're talking to our patients, we are really seeing a lot of stress and distress. Um, I mean, you, everybody's under a lot of pressure and there's a lot of uncertainty and that's a pretty uncomfortable place to be. But for patients who are struggling already with chronic illnesses, um, the diabetes, the hypertension, the obesity, um, that, that they know is putting them at increased risk. Um, and, and then who have underlying anxiety disorders or depression, I mean, everything is becoming exacerbated. Um, illnesses that are, are worsened by stress are, are coming to the forefront. Things like irritable bowel syndrome or um, fibromyalgia. And unfortunately, we are seeing a, an uptick in problems with domestic violence as well. So um, the, the whole layer of what we're doing when we're interfacing with our patients has kind of 
become another um, level of complexity because of all the, the impact of COVID and everything else that's going on in the nation. Um, so we do see patients who are having problems with uh, economically, with job loss, with um, fewer hours, with food insecurity. Um, and fortunately, we recently have started a program of behavioral health that has opened up some new avenues where we can help patients with therapy for their anxiety disorders and or depression or um, coping skills. Um, and we also have a really strong social work department that can help with directing patients and walking through, for example, trying to apply for food stamps for the first time or where the areas are within the Charlottesville area that um, can accommodate patients and provide free food. So directions to the different food banks and food hubs that are throughout, as well as um, prepared foods, right? So prepared meals at the Salvation Army or the um, Haven that provides breakfast for everybody or the soup kitchen. So we do have a lot of resources, but I'm, um, what you really want, if you're trying to maintain your immunity, is pretty good control of those chronic illnesses and a really balanced diet with fresh fruits and fresh vegetables and lean meats. And um, those things are in general harder for our underserved patients to get, get to their table. And now everything is just another layer more difficult. So um, I, I could go on about how we've kind of pivoted to try and do all the testing, but I don't know that it's as pertinent to what we're focusing on here. So. Well, thank you. Um, and, and I do want you to go on uh, a bit. Um, I want to remind the audience that uh, we have a chat feature. Uh, you are invited and encouraged to submit uh, questions. We will do our best to, uh, to address them. Um, we're going to start with questions that have already uh, been um, shared by, by you, uh, by the audience in the uh, registration period. And the first question, um, we actually received a number of questions about precisely this point, Evelyn Scott, um, about nutrition and the importance of uh, of, of nutrition in the context of, uh, as you put it, uh, uh, trying to build and maintain immunity. But you've also suggested that that's particularly challenging for many of your underserved uh, 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 patients. Um, and I'm hoping that you can uh, say a few words about um, are there, are there particular nutrients, are there particular foods that you want your patients uh, gravitating toward. You mentioned uh, 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 produce and, uh, and, and lean meats. Uh, what else do you tell them? What else uh, uh, can you share with, with, with our audience along the lines of nutrition? And then I'm hoping, Richard Morris, that uh, you'll weigh in a little bit about the, the specific challenges um, um, that, that uh, uh, UAC has confronted along the same lines. Evelyn. Right. So um, as I alluded to, probably the best diet you can pick would be something that's varied, like a lot of variation in what colors of fruits and vegetables you're picking and, um, and just a wealth of them. So we, we teach and we try to get our patients to fill half their plate with fruits and vegetables um, because that really is where they're getting the macro and micronutrients that are helpful for immunity. Um, and then keeping uh, the meat to leaner cuts and probably a smaller portion than we're used to with the Western diet here. Um, and then whole grains are, are a helpful thing as well. We, we really try to encourage patients to stay away from the, the very more processed foods, uh, particularly processed meats, but processed foods in general, we know can stimulate kind of an inflammatory reaction in the microbiome of the gut. Um, and that's probably not helpful when you're talking about the inflammatory response to um, what's going on with COVID. Um, there have been a few studies that 
spoke specifically about different nutrients, like vitamin D came up again. Um, the studies are fairly small and uh, not uh, the strongest, they're retrospective in nature. So I think probably the book is still out on any specific vitamin that you pick up. I mean, we do know that there's for general upper respiratory type infections that zinc can be helpful for some, uh, in, in some studies, uh, vitamin C. I mean, but I think if you can get access to and routinely get, again, fresh produce um, along with your grain, your whole grains and your um, lean meats, you're going to be in a good place. But we do know that making the wrong choices are, are where you're going to end up with problems with, well, and amongst other things, making the wrong food choices can exacerbate things like diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and all those comorbidities are, are making it harder to, to do well when you do come down with COVID. So I think this is such an important point that you're making that you want your patients to get these nutrients from food, specifically, as you say, uh, exactly the kinds of fresh produce that uh, Richard, you are, you, you and uh, the, the folks in these neighborhoods are, are growing. And then Kristen, um, you mentioned a moment ago, the fresh pharmacy. And I want to make sure that everybody knows that that's pharmacy with an F, not a PH. And so I'm hoping that um, Richard can speak for a few uh, uh, moments about uh, 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 this in terms of UAC and cultivate. And then you can say a few more words about fresh pharmacy per se. And then after that, we've got some supply chain questions. Thank you, Paul. So, you know, COVID has been an unprecedented lifetime disruption uh, for most people in this uh, country. And that creates a lot of stress. Uh, and a challenge is that it's easy to turn to food for not just our basic calories and nutrition, but for comfort. And uh, sometimes that can, that can create uh, additional problems. One of the things we've seen at UAC with regard to challenges is that many of our older uh, residents who pick up, come out to pick up food, uh, we're not seeing as many uh, of them this year. And I believe, and, and in some cases I've checked with people, where they are just not safe. They don't feel safe coming out. And so it creates, uh, it has created an access problem for people. And of course, affordability is, is always a problem. Uh, COVID brought, has brought along with it some uh, economic challenges uh, for, for many, many people. And so people are having to make uh, prioritized decisions about how they spend their money. And if it's a choice between paying rent and, uh, getting produce, uh, many people are gonna choose to keep a roof over their head. You know, so some things to keep in mind uh, are, from my perspective, is you're not alone. You know, lean into the relationships you have, friends and families. It's always easier to get through tough times uh, when we've got a little bit of help. Uh, look to local services for support. Uh, go for a walk, do something uh, creative, and just try to maintain a balance in what you're eating. If you have a family tradition, let's say it's uh, go out and eat pizza on Friday nights, uh, maybe stay in, make pizza from scratch and put a whole lot of veggies on it at home. Uh, that's a way to maintain, you know, that tradition, but also do it in a, in a much, much, much healthier way. And of course, I'm going to say start a garden. It's never too, too late to start getting into growing, cook and share your food. And of course, observe, you know, COVID hygiene protocols like washing your hands. Excellent. Richard, um, you're making Kevin hungry, I can see, just with that description. Um, and I think that's part of what Kevin is talking about in terms of this shift. You're absolutely right, Kevin, that uh, over the last couple of decades, we've seen an increase in the amount of, uh, of, of money that, uh, that American households spend on food consumed outside of the household, as opposed to food to be consumed in the household. And those lines actually crossed, as you noted, for the first time in the, really the last uh, uh, five or, or six years, Americans uh, are, were spending more on, on food to be consumed outside of the home. Uh, I suspect that that has been rearranged. But Richard, you're making a really important point, um, which is uh, uh, when, when you talk about cooking, which is um, making the food available, that's one step. But giving people the, the knowledge, the skills, the information to work with the produce 
that's, that's the second and equally necessary step. You can give me all the rutabagas in the world. If I don't know what to do with a rutabaga, right, or kale or greens, I, I'm not going to be able to, uh, uh, to make use of it and to, and to get the benefit that Evelyn's talking about. Um, Kristen, can you tell us a little bit about Fresh Pharmacy and, and, and how it works? And in particular, this piece about empowering people to make use of the food. Absolutely. So um, the Fresh Pharmacy program was, con was originally conceived as a prescription fruit and vegetable program in partnership with several um, health clinics in the city of Charlottesville that primarily serve low wealth individuals um, and, and especially those who are at risk for diet related diseases. And it consisted of a bi-weekly supply of carefully curated fresh fruits and vegetables. And I say carefully curated because we put a lot of effort into ensuring that these were, uh, that it was a mix of foods that either required little or no preparation um, or was fairly easy to prepare, um, that was familiar, culturally appropriate, and a good mix of, um, of products. Um, we've continued on that, on that model. It is no longer a prescription program. It is now open to, um, you know, basically anyone in the community who is in need but has a you know has a connection with one of these um, with one of these clinics. So, like I said before, it's it's pretty much tripled in in size um, in the in the face of the pandemic. But a key part of it is that education piece, and um, we try to address that by providing a lot of educational materials, handling, um, recipes, cooking tips, those kinds of things. And again, trying to provide uh, products that are, uh, that are familiar um, and that are not overly complicated um, to prepare. We'd like to do a lot more in the area of, um, of cooking and nutrition and nutrition education. But just a little bit about the, about the results. Um, when it was a prescription program, um, we were able to, or our clinic partners were able to measure biometric improvements um, in health um, during those first couple of years of the program. There was a measurable change in a, in a lot of biometric um, measures. And what I think is even more important, though, is the, is the lifestyle changes that we saw. So we collect a lot of qualitative data through focus groups and interaction with the, with the participants. And we saw a true qualitative change um, in the way people approach um, the way that they eat and their appreciation for, um, for eating healthfully. Because the food is, is sourced locally, it's fresher, it's more vibrant, it tastes better. And so people really just, you know, the enthusiasm was just, um, was just enormous. And, and we've, that has continued to be the case. I mean, this is how we should be eating. And people who don't normally have regular access to this understand that this is the food that provides dignity and provides health and is going to let them get through this pandemic um, you know in the in the best way possible um, so we have some maybe when we talk about the the supply chain um, issues we can talk about what our hopes are for making sure that this access can continue um, beyond the you know beyond the food emergency that we're that we're dealing with good and let's let's turn our attention to that um, in just a moment I want to echo uh, though this this notion that um, there's an engagement and excitement that that comes with um, um, you know taking taking some control of this it, it's empowering and you know we see it not only uh, in Richard's work with with UAC but cultivates work with city schoolyard garden we see this with these these kids right like you know middle school kids and elementary school kids who are growing food and and are learning that wow, this is something they can do. This is, this is something that they can, can be part of. It's, it's, really, um, it's really incredible. Um, so let's talk more about what we, what we imagine uh, uh, the, the near and longer term future looking like. Um, Kevin, you, you talked about uh, many of uh, the challenges, particularly with the, the incredible stress that's been put on the restaurant industry. Um, what, what, what happens now? What do you anticipate uh, the, the supply chain will look like? What needs to happen? Um, and you know, are, are any of these changes going to be permanent? 
uh, or are we just going to go back to what things look like, um, you know, in January of 2020? Well, I'm, I'm very concerned that as the pandemic, as we get through it, that things are going to go back to the way they were, that people are going to get relaxed again. They're going to be wanting to go out to eat, which is fine. I mean, it's, 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 it should be allowable. Um, I'm just afraid that we'll get complacent and that we won't uh, be doing the right things to store our food and be ready for other possible problems. Um, the things that have been discussed here today are very uh, great things to be done. Uh, however, it's all dependent on the ability to grow food locally. And if we were in a situation where that wasn't possible due to um, uh, some type of natural disaster or, or worse, we're still going to be in a spot. And it, it still comes back to, I think, people learning the skills of preserving food for themselves to have some supply on hand. They tell you to have money on hand. <laughs> what good is money if there's nothing there to buy? Okay. And, uh, we have to have the ability to, to store food as well. And, uh, I wanted to compliment what Christian had said earlier about dignity and food. I mean, my, my, my granddaughter is three years old and this, this summer, uh, my wife grew a garden with her and, at three years old, she's learning how to plant seeds and see the seeds produce a plant, produce lettuce, produce cabbage, produce tomatoes, and then see that product eaten. I can call her in the evening and tell her how wonderful it was that I'm eating peas that she planted and they're really good. You know, that's just, I think, training, starting at a very young age, training people to help produce their own food, help be responsible. Uh, so I, I am concerned that as things relax, that we're going to go back to our old ways. Um, I don't know how bad it's got to get for people to change. That concerns me. So Kevin, I think there's a there's one potential uh, policy uh, implication in what you're talking about, and that is. Um, what if we made uh, food education, including skills like canning, part of our uh, public school curriculum? Right? It should be. We, Not we, only the skills, but also the, the availability of places to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're having places for people to garden. Well, we also need places for them to have the equipment to do that type of thing, canneries or things like that. And, and, uh, uh, so like a community commercial level kitchen. Exactly. Process exactly. And, and with someone there to help people walk them through with right. dignity doing right. it. <laughs> so that's interesting. That, I mean, that sounds like the kind of thing that might be a really good idea, even pre COVID. Right. But uh, you're, you've made an interesting case for why it might be uh, necessary as a response, not just to this particular crisis, but to potential future uh, uh, situations. Right. Right. So, Christian, do you want to talk a little bit about, um, uh, you know, speaking to some of Kevin's, um, uh, you know, cautions about not going back to business as usual? Um, you know, business as usual in the short term is pretty unusual. Local Food Hub never did uh, drive through uh, markets on a, on a bi-weekly basis. I mean, you know, one of the things that I hope people are, uh, are hearing is the degree of creativity and energy and risk-taking uh, that uh, we have seen play, play out here. Um, in terms of food provision, in terms of uh, certainly uh, uh, the healthcare response. I mean, I mean, once we can step back and really appreciate it, I think we are going to be absolutely marveling 
at how quickly and creatively people in our communities uh, stepped up and, and, and really um, retooled and refocused in response. Uh, and certainly Local Food Hub uh, has, has been at the forefront of, of that um, with respect to the, uh, uh, to the markets that you're running. And, and I hope you might talk a little more about that and what might become of those. Sure. Well, real, um, yes. So the, I, I would say the, the real credit goes to the, the producers, the farmers who um, proved to be so nimble and so agile and so quickly able to, um, you know, to pivot their business models, but not only to participate in these drive through markets, but to also be creative about new ways to reach consumers. I would say that the biggest difference that is going to probably outlast this pandemic is the change to direct to consumer um, provision of food. So not only farms, but um, distribution companies, many others adopted a new approach of delivering straight to you know, straight to consumers, whether it was through an online ordering system or um, in, you know, in many cases, the farms would get together and they'd, they'd put together packages of, you know, of local food that people could order. A lot of it did move online and, that, you know, and that is a big switch. I think that is the fact that people found they had the ability to source this food that they, that they love so much and, and so appreciate and they could source it um, directly and have it delivered to their door, um, I think is going to be something that is that is going to to last past the past the pandemic. Um, and the, you know, the demand was just extraordinary. I mean, the demand for and particularly local food, because I think people, you know, were really were really fearful about what the kind of larger supply chain challenges were going to be. The, the demand for local food grew exponentially during the first few months of the of the pandemic. It's leveled off a little bit, but it has um, but it has remained very high. And so I guess the hope is that is that the enthusiasm for um, eating in that way more fresh food, more local food sourced from local farmers or, you know, or wherever, but just eating in that different way. The hope is that um, that that will, you know, that that will last. Um, I guess just to address um, if this is an appropriate time, there were, you know, some questions about about policy. Um, I also hope that this pandemic results in a um, in a change in how we think about um, supporting people through policy and accessing in accessing food. So the biggest program that comes to mind is the SNAP program, the Nutritional um, Benefits Program. And you know, already that program has gone through some changes to allow it to um, allow you know folks to um, to source more um, fresh food through their SNAP benefits. Um, but there is much more that could be done, um, both in terms of, um, you know, making those benefits available to, um, you know, to buy fresh food in the grocery store, but also making farmers markets much more accessible, whatever they end up looking like at, after the pandemic. Um, but, it, it, you know, also um, what comes to mind is lots of farms have um, these programs called community supported agriculture, where you can really buy a share of the of the farm and, and pick up fresh fruit direct from the farm. If we could make those kinds of shares available to people at a subsidized rate and come up with a mechanism for um, for that food, um, you know, being delivered. There's lots of creative ways that we can bridge the connections between this bountiful food that we have in our areas, you know, all of us across the country, and people who can really benefit from the, that food, um, I think that that would be a that would be an outcome that would be very positive. It would make the food system much more equitable and much more health promoting than it is now. Great. Let me um, let me pick up on that and and give the others uh, a chance to uh, address uh, this this very question about. Uh, policy changes either at the national level or perhaps at the state and local level that you would like to see uh, in response to not just COVID, but where we are now in terms of, uh, of our food system. Uh, Richard, Kevin, Evelyn, do any of you want to want to speak to that? Richard? You know, I would like to see policy change around uh, 
municipal commitment to urban agriculture. So urban agriculture as a, as a necessity, as a designed built component of, of uh, city spaces, as opposed to just something that fills in, in a, in a uh, blank uh, garden or, or a, a green face. Uh, and along with that commitment of land to urban agriculture, I would love to see a, a department within uh, local government that where there is an urban agriculture person, director, who uh, helps put together the, uh, helps create a cohesive and welcoming urban agriculture um, uh, potential for the community. So when you look at, uh, you look at some of what's gone on in Richmond, you look at some of what's gone on uh, in uh, places like Atlanta around urban agriculture, where you do see a local government uh, making a strong commitment to urban agriculture. But I, I think if we could have a commitment to land and a commitment at the local level uh, where there's a urban agriculture czar, I'm not sure what you'd call them. Uh, I think that would go, make, go a long distance uh, for helping us continue to provide food, also you know, help people get used to the idea that you can produce food, that we have the capacity to produce food. We don't have to go to the store and buy everything. Great, um, Evelyn and Kevin. Evelyn, did you have Yeah, I, well, I definitely would uh, support and reinforce that urban agriculture is a great place to start. I really like the idea of working with the schools that I know we're doing, but expanding on that um, and not only having the students participate because it is an exciting thing to see seeds grow into plants, grow into fruit that you can eat. Um, and, and how important that is for the nutrition, but not only having maybe agricultural, but a tied in old fashioned home economics uh, course, right? Where they are learning how to cook fresh fruit and um, vegetables so that they're palatable and, um, and they can even maybe teach their parents a little bit more about that. And I think it needs to be on a lot of different levels from uh, kindergarten through high school and then supporting, you know, agricultural education in, in graduate schools. Great, Kevin. Well, um, what Richard was saying about uh, uh, the land, he's exactly right. But to do, to protect some of that land, you need to plan ahead. And I mean, that's something that local uh, government needs to be aware of and think about and uh, take care of it as you're doing zoning planning and uh, development planning. You've got to, you know, the, the good land, it is where it is. That might not be the most convenient for a development project, but you're not going to move that land. You've got you've to keep the good soil where it's at and make use of it. And, uh, as, as communities evolve and develop, if you're going to move to that type of system, you've got to protect places and land to, to do that. Also, it's work. You know, it's nice to talk about doing these kinds of things, but it has to be funded and it has to have the, 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 the staff to do it. We have to have creative ways to make people want to participate in it. And that also may mean hiring the help from out of this country to do it. And, and we've got to keep laws in place that allow us to bring people in and out of this country legally to help do that work. Um, I have a staff of about 40 employees and some of my most productive employees do not live in this country permanently. Great point and, uh, and an important reminder um, I want to remind uh, our audience that in the chat, not only do you have a chance to uh, make uh, to pose questions, but we've put some resources in, some links to the organizations uh, um, that uh, that are represented here. So I want to uh, invite people to go uh, and and take a look at that and uh, uh, maybe uh, pursue these. 
um, uh, uh, learn a little bit more. We, we had a question about an organization that is not represented here directly, uh, but with which several of the folks here have worked, and that's the uh, IRC, the International Rescue Committee. Uh, here in Charlottesville, the IRC has a New Roots Farm program, and uh, Kevin, you mentioned people uh, uh, coming to do agriculture from other places. Uh, the New Roots Farm uh, is, has been uh, an opportunity for uh, people who have been refugees to Charlottesville, people who have relocated to Charlottesville, uh, to, to practice agri agriculture. Um, and Richard, I believe that you have worked closely with uh, the New Roots folks over the years. Uh, yes, we have. As a matter of fact, one of, uh, one of the ways we were creative uh, around COVID is the New Roots farmers uh, were selling their produce to local restaurants, which essentially ceased operation because of COVID. And so we were able to step in and be a conduit for, for their produce. We purchased their produce from them. So we kept their, their businesses going and we also met our, helped, it helped us meet our need to, uh, to supply food to our residents. So another example of the kind of creativity and collaboration um, that, that we've been hearing about and talking about, um, I'm hoping that, you know, we, we, we've gotten several questions asking about um, different ways to participate and uh, different ways even to contribute to these efforts as we head into the fall now and into the winter, as we look ahead to the holiday season, as we, I think, recognize that, um, as, as Kristen noted, um, the, the end to the pandemic that we thought would uh, have arrived uh, by the fall will not have uh, arrived by the holiday season. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that people can speak a little bit to uh, what we as members of the community can do to help, to participate, to support these efforts. Um, I don't know, Kristen, do you, want to, do, you, do you want to call our attention to anything? Well, certainly there are, um, you know, there are numerous organizations well beyond the ones that are represented here that are doing really important work to connect people with, um, with healthful food. So I would, uh, you know, I would just recommend seeking those out in the community where you live and, and, you know, helping to support them. There are many, many volunteer opportunities right now because volunteer, volunteerism has, has also fallen off because of the pandemic. So if you feel up to it and, um, and you feel safe doing it, there are lots of opportunities for volunteering. Um, but I guess, you know, most of all, I would naturally say this from my perspective, but continue to buy locally, continue to find ways to buy from your local farmers. I mean, I think one of the big challenges that we face going into the winter, the fall, the winter, and next spring, is that farmers simply don't know what it is going to look like. Um, next year. Are restaurants going to open up or are they not? Are they going to continue to have to do online sales and direct-to-consumer deliveries? Um, you know, is, is demand going to continue the way it has been? They don't want to plant too little and not have the supply if there's, if there's a great demand, but they don't want to plant too much and not be able to sell their product. So, um, so as much, you know, as much love and support as we can give to all of our farmers, um, I think, um, you know, the better. And, you know, here in Virginia, I know, I know the um, audience is from lots of different places, but here in Virginia, we actually have a fairly long growing season. Um, and there are lots of products that are grown here that are storage crops and that last throughout the winter. So, you know, at Local Food Hub, we, we used to have, you know, apples and, and storage crops well into February, March, you know, even later. So, so it is, I guess what I'm saying is it is between those kinds of products and, um, and the products that are stored and, and lightly processed, as Kevin was talking about, there is an opportunity to eat locally pretty much all year round if you, you know, if you put your mind to it. Um, so that would just be a, a, you know, another thing that, that I would recommend. Great. Uh, Evelyn, what should we keep in mind and what might we do from your perspective as, as we head uh, uh, into the winter season and the holiday season? Right, so hmm. I think in order to support, I would absolutely uh, reinforce the need to volunteer. I know there are uh, volunteer opportunities with some of the food banks, both volunteering time and volunteering to donate some money. Um, and 
certainly if you, it isn't too late, certainly to start a crop of uh, your own fresh vegetables. If you're going for uh, cold season vegetables, those kind of things, um, lettuces and, yeah, well, I should let the farmers talk more of that. Okay, so even uh, uh, going so far as to as, as to plant our own our own gardens, and I'm seeing in uh, in the chat um, there are places. Uh, thank you, Laura Jane, uh, for telling us about the uh, uh, Denton, Texas's Shiloh Garden, the largest community garden in the U.S. Interesting, and thanks for joining us from Denton, um, Kevin. As you think about uh, as you think about heading towards the holiday, what do you think? I just think plan ahead, plan okay. ahead, figure out what you, what you're going to need and start using the resources that we've talked about today and start gathering, plan ahead. And I think you'll be fine. Don't, don't wait. Don't be a procrastinator like I am about going <laughs> about some things, uh, plan ahead. Good. Um, and just to echo Evelyn's point, um, uh, both Local Food Hub and uh, uh, Cultivate are, are nonprofits that do accept support. Uh, and I say that as a supporter, uh, and in the case of, of Cultivate, as a, uh, uh, as a board member, these organizations are, are integral uh, in our, uh, to our local food system and um, it really have been doing phenomenal work. And so they won't say it, but I'll say it. Um, it they are, they're really critical. Um, we are heading towards uh, uh, the end of our presentation. I wanna thank uh, all of the audience members who are posting really helpful, really useful uh, links along with really good questions some of which are too good in the sense that, uh, for example, investigating the environmental impact of local versus uh, uh, conventional agriculture is something that uh, we're gonna have to come back and do another panel on because that is uh, a really fascinating uh, and important set of questions. Um, I wanna go around the horn and give people a chance to make any uh, closing uh, uh, comments, anything you think our audience should know, should hear about, should think about. Kevin, plan ahead, I know. Um, if you want to uh, put a final point on that or add anything, please, uh, uh, please do. Um, but Evelyn, uh, why don't we start with you and just as we, as, as, as we move um, through this pandemic, um, what, what do you want us to do, to know, to keep in mind? I think that uh, it's it really is important to acknowledge that this is a stressful thing. It's stressful for everyone on a lot of different layers. Um, and I think we, we tend to not ask for help to, to pretend things are still going all right when maybe they aren't. Um, and you know, we talk a lot about physician burnout on our level, but I think burnout can happen to any, any, um, any job level. Uh, and you need to pay attention to that. Um, the first sign being exhaustion, right? So you just can't, you feel drained by all of the stress that is a, of the things that you're having to deal with. And I would encourage people to pay attention to that and to support each other, um, to check in with each other. And, you know, eating a healthy diet is one part of, of staying healthy and staying resilient um, when you're having to deal with this kind of long-term and acute stress at the same time. Um, but other parts include regular exercise and, and connecting with your friends and family and support group and making sure that you're checking in on everybody. So I would, I would advocate to um, hit it on all levels, eat the healthy food, do the exercise, stay connected and acknowledge if you're having some problems and get some help. Super, thank you. Um, Richard. Uh, I will uh, follow on by, by saying, you know, support your local organizations that are working in the food space. Uh, Farming is a tough business and uh, it's always uh, a lot of work, but I'd also like to shout out to uh, support the idea of supporting your black and brown uh, farmers in your area because it is particularly tough 
uh, for them uh, in these uh, trying, challenging times. Great. Um, we are going to try to assemble some resources that we can make available to uh, audience members. And Richard, I think a really useful resource there might be um, uh, lists of um, uh, folks here in this community and in other communities so that people who want to do precisely that can find out, well, how can I support black and brown food producers and uh, restaurateurs, et cetera. So um, that's something that uh, along with some of these other uh, uh, resources that, that we think might be helpful uh, uh, following on to the, uh, to the panel, uh, we'll try to make available great. Uh, Kevin, as you, uh, uh, as you think about what you want folks to keep in mind uh, after the panel. Well, <clears throat> you know, we'd all like for this to, to end quickly. And I realize that we have a lot of powerful science working for us to help with that. Uh, however, I can't help thinking back about the history of the last pandemic. And I think uh, from what I have learned that that took about two and a half to three years to work through. It wasn't a quick fix. So I think we have to relax and realize that we're in this for a little longer haul. And we really need to, to pay attention and, and start changing our habits some. And uh, I think we also need to realize that we are in a very, very blessed, bountiful country. And uh, when you look around the world, we may have our problems, but I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And this pandemic is worldwide. There are a lot of folks suffering worldwide beyond our borders. And, um, since we are so blessed as we can move ahead in the future, we need to, to, to uh, keep those folks in mind as well. And then when we can come up with programs that would be helpful worldwide, we need to be willing to share and, and help with those, uh, the health of the whole world, not just our local folks. That's my thoughts. Great, and, and I think that's, that's right. Um, you know, we, we're often uh, uh, told to think globally and act locally, but um, sometimes we need to uh, act globally and locally. So that's right. a good, uh, uh, reminder. Um, and, and you're absolutely right about the, the bounty uh, of the United States, but also of Virginia and, yes. and this part of the Commonwealth. Um, as you know, of course, um, we are unusually fortunate here, and I think that provides us with an opportunity and a responsibility to take these uh, uh, questions really seriously and think about uh, uh, how what our response ought to be. We, you know, we we're 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 reminded that we vote with our forks, and that's absolutely true. I'm a political scientist, so I always remind people we vote with our votes, and that's part of this as we think about uh, uh, the policy. We have opportunities, um, not just at the presidential level, but uh, uh, at, at state and local levels to take these things seriously and to think about how some of the policy uh, responses uh, that people have mentioned might, uh, might play out. And, uh, I, I think I, I simply want to remind us that we're also citizens, we're consumers, we're eaters, we're neighbors, but we're also citizens and we do have the opportunity and responsibility uh, to act politically as, as, as well as in these other ways. Um, Kristen. Yeah, I think I'd just piggyback on what Evelyn said, which is that um, one of the most important ways that we can um, take care of ourselves in this, um, you know, in these trying times is to eat healthfully. It's the most important thing you can, you know, you can do. Um, and eating healthfully and locally 
serves not only your own self-care, but it also helps your local economy. It helps your local farmer. Um, it helps your local environment, even though I know we're not talking about that right now. I love to talk about it. I just want <laughs> it has, you know, it, ha it has a lot of, um, it has a, it has a lot of layers to it. And so um, I, I think just keeping that in mind and keeping in mind that with a little creativity, it is possible um, for most, if not all months of the year and, um, and to, and to really learn about that, really learn about what is um, available in, you know, in your locality, your region, um, and, you know, and how you can access it. I think that's, one of the most important things we can do. Terrific. Well, I want to thank all of you, uh, Kristen, Richard, Evelyn, Kevin. I want to thank uh, the audience for joining us, for asking great questions, for uh, putting really super um, resources into the chat. We will, uh, as I say, make, uh, make those resources uh, available after the, uh, after the panel. Um, I want to thank again Rebecca Deeds uh, from Morgan, Althea Brooks from Lifetime Learning. And I want to turn things over uh, uh, to finish up to Molly Harris from the Virginia Farm Bureau. Thank you all so much for an amazing discussion. My name is Molly Harris, and on behalf of Virginia Farm Bureau, I want to thank everyone for a fabulous panel. So much wisdom and insight into a challenging topic. I would like to give a special thank you to our panelists, Dr. Evelyn Scott of UVA Health and Kevin Engel of Engel Family Farms. Thank you for sharing your professional insights related to the intersection of healthcare and agriculture systems. Also I wanna thank Kristen Swoko and of Local Food Hub and Richard Moore of Cultivate Charlottesville for joining our panel as key members of the Charlottesville food system we appreciate your work and loved hearing from you. I'd like to give a special thank you to Paul Friedman of the Department of Politics at UVA who has played an instrumental role in the making of this program possible. Your dedication to bringing programs like this to your students and to the Charlottesville community at large is greatly appreciated. It has been an honor and a privilege for Virginia Farm Bureau to bring you this program today in partnership with Rebecca Deeds of Morgan Programs and Althea Brooks of Lifetime Learning at the University of Virginia. And with that, I would like to thank all of you, the participants who joined us on today's webinar. We look forward to similar programs in the future and hope you have a wonderful evening. <laughs>